So, you want to be an audiobook narrator? I'm suddenly feeling a bit Captain America. So, you want to be an audiobook narrator? Well, I'm going to tell you what it's like. In case you've just landed here without knowing who I am or having seen any of my other videos. They're mostly about ducks anyway, but that's another story. Um, hello, my name is Emma Newman and I am an author and an audiobook narrator. And I'm recording this at the studio I work in um, for the vast majority of my audiobook work. Um, and I've recorded about 30,000 words today. This is the end of the day. And um, Aaron, who is one of the co-founders of Audio Factory, has very kindly let me film this video in situ because I wanted to show you what it was like in the recording booth um, and to tell you about being an audiobook narrator. Uh, I've recorded over 50 audiobooks now in multiple genres. I'm just counting uh, nine of those books uh, are my own, uh, plus two novellas as well, um, and all the rest are by other people. Uh, science fiction, fantasy, quite a few crime novels, um, some romances, um, a huge non-fiction book. Um, so yes, I've done lots and lots of audiobooks and uh, people are always quite curious about what it's like being an audiobook narrator and I wanted to tell you what it involves because I think lots of people have a kind of like secret or not perhaps not so secret desire to be an audiobook narrator too and when I've started to talk to people about what it's like this kind of look of horror slowly descends on their face when they realise it's not my, what you might have been thinking. How about I show you the studio that I work in? I'll just lean out of the way. Don't take any notice of what's on that screen because um, that is actually not the project I've just been recording. It's a different thing. Um, this is my Remarkable, um, which I should probably do a video on as well because it's actually very useful if you're an author and an audiobook narrator. Um, usually in the past, I used an iPad and Audio Factor Audio Factory have their own iPad that you can read the manuscript from. Um, this is the microphone. This is a pop shield so that plosives um, aren't a problem when you're narrating. Um, the desk looks a bit strange because in the times of plague, um, the desk had to be washed down after every narrator. Um, so it's just made it go a bit bobbly. Um, tea mug, very important. Bonus superheroes um and glasses and water i wear these headphones in the booth when i put them on it deadens all of the sound um and i'll talk about why we use those in a moment but yes this is what it's like and you can see that there's this um foam all over it's, it's on the ceiling as well you can't see that it's on the door that closes into the booth and there's actually a whole other layer of construction outside of this booth, so it's double skinned to insulate from um, external noise. Um, after I've finished talking to you, I'll do a couple of shots here, which is probably out of shot for you. Um, there is an actual window and through there is where the director sits. Um, and I'll talk about the process in a little while. So this is where I narrate. Many, many, many years ago, I was writing and uh, I finished my first book. I was trying to get it published. I was getting absolutely nowhere. Spoiler, it was a terrible book and it deserved to go nowhere, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't think that at the time. And I was desperate for feedback because I was just getting rejections. And so I decided that I was going to record a chapter and put it on my website every week to get feedback on the story. And when I look back on it now, I think that's absolutely crazy. I would never do that now. But my thinking at the time was that it was a way for me to get it out into the world um, without uh, jeopardising any future publication rights because I hadn't reproduced the text anywhere. So anyway, I started just literally 
speaking it into like a gaming headset microphone <laughs> and um over the weeks as i was publishing this weekly chapter more and more people were saying how much they enjoyed the narration they said nice things about the story too but it was the, the narration stuff that really surprised me and uh times were tough financially and i suddenly saw the opportunity for a potentially another income stream so i looked into audiobook narration and i found a company that um i'm not sure if they're still trading i'm not going to mention who they are but they were taking open auditions for home-based narrators who do all of their own editing and I auditioned and I got the gig and I could not believe it. So I hurriedly asked my stepdad to help me build a makeshift recording booth and uh, recorded this book. And it was a vertical learning curve. I haven't listened to that book since and I dread to think what my performance was like. Um, but I really enjoyed it. And fast forward on a few years, I got my first proper book deal. Um, I won't talk about the abortive one that happened, but the first proper book deal with the Split World series. And I asked the publishers very nicely if I could perhaps be considered for the narration of my own book, because by that point, I think I'd narrated about 10 books. And I auditioned for my own book and got the gig. And the uh, audiobook publisher was based in the States. I live in the UK and they had to find a studio that was convenient for me to record in. They found Audio Factory. They put me in touch and here I am nine years later, still working with Audio Factory. Um, I'll put their details in the description of the video. Um, I'm going to be biased, obviously, but they are the most professional, the best audio book studio I've ever worked with and I've worked with a couple of others um, but Audio Factory, um, the guys who run it, Aaron and Dave, are fantastic um, and I, I couldn't recommend them more. And so we recorded the first Split Worlds novel and that was my first experience of studio recording. All of my recording before that point had been at my home booth um, and I just learned so much from them and uh, their business took off, my career took off and um, yeah, and we still work together all these years later. And I think I've probably recorded, oh, I don't know, over 30 books with them. People have asked if you get like a special script or a special version. No, you just get the book, the actual book. And it's at the stage where the final version of the book has been produced and it's like about to go to press. Um, and that's when the audiobook gets recorded because you want it to be the final version, the version that will be published. And in publishing, sometimes that can be quite close to the wall. So um, we sometimes get a version of the manuscript, which is um, pre the final um, proof. Um, so with, there may be typos in it. Sometimes we get the final final and it still has typos and we feed those back to the publisher as part of the process. Um, and that's in every single book, every single book ever, because there's no better way to proofread a book than to read it aloud. So we get the manuscript and there's a pre-production phase. And in the pre-production phase, I, as the narrator, read the book from cover to cover. And I have a notebook, which I have right here. I've had many over the years. And in this notebook, um, I just realized I can't show you any of these notes because they're for other people's audiobooks and that would be rude. Um, but anyway, on the left hand side, um, I have cast. And as I come across every single new character in the book, I write down their name. And if there are any descriptors in the text about what this person is like, I put it next to that name. Um, so I'm not going to name the book and I'm not going to name the characters, but some of my notes are tired, worn down, lower, huskier, um, high pitch, plummy, unpleasant, um, boss, booming voice. Um, so things like that.
it's really, really, really important to read the entire book through when it comes to um, deciding the characterization of the voices. I did an audiobook a few years ago, which was a crime novel. And I think it was like on page something like 276, it was revealed that the murderer had a Scottish accent, hadn't been described that way before. And so if I hadn't read the book ahead of that point, I wouldn't have known that in particular scenes, I would have to use that accent. And it was only when he was angry and so it was, there's quite an interesting challenge with crime novels because if you have the murderer saying things in audio, you can spoiler the reveal of who the murderer is. So there are things that you do to get around that, like, you know, you have them being uh, whispering more or um, the thing that just popped into my head was like a Batman voice, <laughs> Batman as opposed to Bruce Wayne. Um, but yeah, there are there are ways you can get around it. Um, but yeah, in certain circumstances, this character had to have a Scottish accent. So I had to go back and go through the text again, marking up in my manuscript all of those bits of dialogue. And what I do is I highlight them, especially for an accent that I am not comfortable, that is not very easy for me. Um, I go back and mark them up. And accents are one of the really important things to pick out in that read through because sometimes it will be an accent that I don't know how to do. And then I have to go and research how to do that accent. And that can be really, really hard. So anyway, you go through, you read through the entire book, you have your cast. On the right hand page, I have a chapter breakdown of which characters are in that chapter. And that's important because when you're recording, if there's a character coming up which has got a difficult accent. Sometimes I will ask to have a tea break and a practice before a particular one. And if that's the case, I put an asterisk next to the name of that character. But also it's always good. There's a brief pause between chapters when you're recording. You can look ahead and go, ah, OK, right. It's that person, that person, that person. You can check your notes. You can have a brief dis discussion with the director um, and then carry on. Um, the other thing that I do is check pronunciations and sometimes I will have a separate list of words, particularly if it's a book which has got a lot of locations um, and sometimes just words that I've only ever seen when I've read a book. I've never actually said them. And there's no guarantee that that means that I will not have to check a pronunciation during recording. Sometimes I will be recording and I'll say a word the way that I've always said it acquired through family accents and my director will say uh, no the correct pronunciation is this or are you sure that's the right way to pronounce it or sometimes I won't even be sure until I'm in the booth and I suddenly go oh this is the word I know so well in text form that I forgot to look up the pronunciation I didn't realize I wasn't confident about that when I did my read through and so literally all we do is quickly jump online the director has a computer which is connected to the internet obviously and uh, we usually go to the Cambridge Online Dictionary because they usually have UK and US pronunciations of words. Um, because sometimes, because of the dominance of American um, television and film, there are some words which I may default to as the US pronunciation and in fact that's wrong, so we have to check it. Uh, and that's that's how I prep a book. People have asked like if how many times you rehearse a book. I don't. You never. I don't rehearse a book. Um, I do the read through. I do all of the prep. If it's a science fiction or fantasy book where there are unusual character names, or if they're names um, from uh, other languages uh, in the real world or a fantasy world, it doesn't matter. Um, I will usually get um, guidance from, uh, well, the director, that's part of the director's pre-production, is to go through the book as well. The director reads the entire book and they will send queries to the author or the publisher, um, sometimes direct, sometimes via the publisher, about how words are pronounced and names if they're not, um, like especially in science fiction and fantasy, you can have words that are completely new. They're, they're made up for that world. And so we check. Um, and I always check 
um, because I'm an author and I know how important it is to have it sound the way that it's always been in your head as you've been writing it. When we come in to the studio for the first day of recording, we will have a brief meeting before we start recording, go through the cast list. Um, before this point, usually I'll get an email from the director with notes on the characters, and sometimes I need to record samples for particular characters that will either just be for the director to be happy with, or sometimes we send them to the author and say, is it okay? Is this voice all right for this particular character? Um, not every single project, but some. Um, and then we have a meeting when we're in the studio, we go through and make sure that we're comfortable with all of the different um, voices. And also sometimes there's a discussion about the tone of the book or where the tension points are. Particularly in crime novels, we will have a discussion about how not to give away the identity of the killer if it's relevant. Um, and that, yeah, it's a very brief meeting. It'll only be like 10, 15 minutes. And then I come into the booth, as you can see here, and I start to warm up. And the thing about the voice, um, is that particularly when it's first thing in the morning um, it can be a little bit croaky and you need to warm up um, and it usually takes somewhere between five and ten minutes for me and I sing in the car on the way to the studio to speed that up sometimes I'm not in the mood for singing though so it takes a bit longer um, and there's a point where you it's almost like I can feel my voice relax um, and I can speak it's ever so slightly deeper. It, um, I don't know how it sounds at the moment because I find talking to camera excruciatingly difficult and I'm very aware my voice might be croaky because of nerves. Um, but when I'm, when I'm in the flow, when, when the voice is warmed up and when I've settled into the book, about three pages in, I tend to relax a lot more and then we go. So we don't practice the book beforehand. And what that means is that we, I say we here as in audiobook narrators in general, like I can only speak for myself. I've never been trained. I've just learnt this on the job. Um, but if there are particular things that I need to watch for in a manuscript, sometimes it's not necessarily clear who is speaking in an exchange until further down. So I may put a note at the, the page about which character is saying that particular line or if there is a note in the narrative about how they're delivering the line, which is after a big load of dialogue, I will pop it up to the top because when I'm reading, when I'm narrating in the booth, it's sight reading effectively. And that's one of the, arguably, in my opinion, one of the most important skills that you need to have as an audiobook narrator is the ability to sight read, but I'll get onto that in a moment. I'm just going to give you an idea of what it's like, the process of recording a book. So usually in a day of recording, I will record somewhere around a hundred pages of a book. Usually that's somewhere between 30 to 35,000 words. Obviously it depends on the book and the format of the book. Um, but yeah, what it means is that an average book of about 90,000 words is three days of recording time. And that day you have an hour recording, narrating, and then you have a 10, 15 minute break, and then you do another hour, and then probably a half hour lunch break, go back in for another hour, 15 minute tea break. And we usually do five, sometimes six sessions in a day, um, depending on the constraints of the schedule. So it's it's a lot of reading. And as I said, I was going to mention about the earphones. So these earphones deaden all of the sound for me in the booth. And my voice, what I'm saying in that moment into the mic is piped through to these headphones. So I hear what I have just said, or I hear what I am saying as I'm saying it. And so for me, certainly, that is a very odd processing experience because at the same time as I am reading ahead a line, ahead of what I'm actually speaking, so I'm speaking a line, I'm reading ahead, 
but I am also processing how the line I'm speaking is sounding in my headphones because I want to check if I've said it correctly or if I'm happy with the delivery. And so your brain, well, my brain at least, splits into simultaneous input-output processing and it can really fry your brain. People have asked, how do, you, how do you read for that longer period of time? And there is stamina involved. When I first started narrating in my home booth, I could narrate for 20 minutes at a time. And then I, my voice would get croaky and it would, my throat would hurt. Now I'm recording five or six hours a day of solid reading with those breaks. Um, and yeah, I won't lie, at the end of the day, I feel it. I feel it in my voice. Um, I always ask when I'm um, when I've been given an audiobook gig to have no more than two days back to back, um, just because I find that if I do two days in a row, the third day I'm very tired. My brain is very tired. I'm also autistic, so I don't know if that's the same for all narrators. I don't know if it's because I'm autistic or whether that's the same for everybody. I don't know, but I get very, 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 very tired. Um, and I will just make more errors and my voice gets strained. There are probably, you know, people who only do audiobooks. That's their main job and they probably do five days a week and would be laughing at this, but I'm just telling you my experience. Um, so I try and do only two days back to back, um, five to six hours a day of recording. Um, sometimes it's two days, then a day off and then another two days. Um, and we just do that until the book is done. When you make an error when you're recording, um, if the director picks it up straight away, they will just jump in and say, uh, you dropped a word there, or sometimes I just say the wrong word because it's just the way you parse a sentence. Sometimes, sometimes it will, um, my brain will think it knows what the next word is and then we'll just say the wrong one. Um, and so I will just pause and then redo the line. In the past, I've done punch in um, recording where if there's an error, you stop recording, the um, producer goes back and finds the location of the original error and then you start recording from that point. We used to do that years ago. We don't do that so much now. There's no right or wrong way to do it. All you're doing is weighting the um, labour differently. If you do the punch in method where you go back and re-record over the error, then you're going to have fewer edits um, for the actual editor. Um, but it can make the time in the recording studio longer. So it just it depends on what, what that, particular per that particular company's preference is. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Um, and then obviously there will be errors that aren't picked up during recording. And when the book is edited, it's sent off to proof listeners and they write a report on the errors. And I'm also a proof listener. So you, you listen for any like background sounds or um, perhaps um, like an editing um, artifact where perhaps a breath sound has been cut off abruptly or something like that. And you mark it up in a report. And then when that's done, um, you have a pickup session and a pickup session is where I come back to the studio. Um, we have the sound engineer, the, the editor, the sound editor, um, and he runs through every sing he runs through every um, point on the report and we re-record the line. For every hour of time I'm recording in the studio, we generally get about 50 minutes of finished um, audio time. And that's quite important in terms of the profitability of an audiobook. If you have a narrator who makes lots and lots and lots and lots of errors, then that is going to prolong the time in the studio recording the book and the editing time and the pickup session is going to be longer as well. So, you know, it's it's good for everybody to um, do as clean a read as you possibly can. Um, and, you you know, there are always going to be errors. There are days when, you know, you're, you're just tired um, and it depends on the book. Sometimes it depends on the particular scene. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, that's how we deal with errors. Sometimes you pick them up as you're recording. If you don't pick them up when recording and they get through to the proofing stage, you sort it out in the pickups. What else do I need to talk about? So that's the process. The director, how, how I work with the director. Okay. So I love working with a director. There are some books that I do where I just record from home with no director and they're fine and luckily the books nowadays the only books i record from home are for one of my favorite authors i love her work i'm very familiar with her work and i feel quite confident in the way that it should be delivered um i think i might find it a little bit daunting to do an entire audiobook for an author i don't know self-directed because the thing that the director really really helps with um, well, there's two main things, three main weapons, but no, there are, there are two main things that the director does for me. One is they are your immediate kind of check on what you've just recorded. So they have a very good sense of the pacing, the tone, where the tension is building, where the tension should be released. They're one step back from it than I am because I'm obviously reading it aloud at that point. And whilst I will have a, an instinct for it and a very firm idea of what I want to do, sometimes I haven't got it right. Or sometimes the director has a different opinion about how that line should be delivered. And so having that comment sometimes can lift a line that I wouldn't have seen in that particular way. Um, the other thing that the director does is you sometimes need to have a discussion about the best way to portray a character or the best way to um, convey the tension in a scene. Um, but also when you're actually in the scene itself, sometimes, certainly for me, um, I may not change that tone quickly enough or um, I may think that I've paced it correctly, but I haven't. And that is really, really critical for the director to say, can you do that line again, but come in it with a, a brighter energy or, um, you know, can you, this is like the duh, duh, duh at the end of the chapter. So deliver that line more slowly, things like that. I really do think that directors lift the performance of an audiobook immensely, a good director. And also they will also, they will help you with pronunciations too. Um, there's a director who I love, working with called Kate. Hello, Kate, if you're watching this. Um, and mm, she is so good on pronunciations. Um, and I've learned a huge amount from her. Um, we did a book together last year, which was a nonfiction novel, which uh, was really, really long. Um, I think it was something like 180,000 words. It was super, super long. And it was um, about three generations of a particular family in Europe. I'm being deliberately vague because I don't feel I should really talk about particular projects. Um, and it had literally pages and pages of my notebook full of locations, pronunciations for those locations and names, European names of the time that had different pronunciations depending on which country that person came from. and also um, like French expressions and things like that. I used to speak French and Spanish fluently and certainly having a grasp of French has been very, very useful um, in several projects. Um, but Kate also um, speaks French and so that was super, super useful. So there are some books which are really technically challenging uh, and that was probably the most technically challenging book I've done, but one of the most rewarding as well. Um, I'd really love to do more books like that. I'm recording, the book I'm recording at the moment um, is a joy, was a joy. I did the last day today and it was an absolute joy to narrate. Uh, there were zero difficult accents. I didn't have to prepare any accents. I don't get paid extra if there's lots of accents and lots of pronunciation checks. Um, in fact, that's what you want to know, isn't it? How much do you get paid as an audiobook narrator? Find out in part two. No, I'm not going to do that to you. So um, there are two ways that you can get paid as an audiobook narrator. One is a um, royalties only model. 
um, and one is a per finished hour. In the early days of my career, I did royalty only. And I would not recommend that in general if you are dependent on this work in terms of financial survival, which I am. Times are tough. And yeah, I did not make nearly enough money from those early books because not only was I narrating, I was also doing all of the sound editing as well. It was hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work. So if you imagine the average book has, when it's finished, is 10 hours long. So that means probably then it was longer, but for every hour, every per finished hour of that audiobook, I was probably recording back then for an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes. Then there's all of the preparation time beforehand, reading the book, researching the pronunciations, acquiring accents. And then afterwards, editing the book, generally it takes one and a half to two times the length of the thing that you're editing, it's, at least it does for me. So that's hours, so that's what? Two and a half to three hours worth of work per finished audio, and probably a bit more back then because I was still learning. And it's very intellectually demanding. Intellectually demanding is the wrong phrase. It's very brain tiring. You can't, at least I can't do other types of work at the same time. I can't write a novel in the same day that I'm recording an audiobook. And usually I try to block out those projects. If I've got a week where I'm recording an audiobook, I'm not doing any other writing work because my brain cannot process any more words. That's all, all the words. I only have a finite number of words. They all come to the booth. There are none left for anybody else. So the royalties only method was very good in the early part of my career because it enabled me to build up a portfolio. It's very, very low risk for the audiobook publisher. I've never done that with Audio Factory. This was for um, a publisher in another country. And it's very low risk for them. It's very high risk for you as the narrator because you have no idea how many copies are going to be sold. And as with all royalties, you get a very small percentage of the sale price, a very small percentage. And actually it's getting smaller. Um, I've been doing this long enough now. I've been doing this for 10 years now. And in that 10 years, I have seen the way the industry has been changed by certain huge companies that has had an effect on the payment going to uh, narrators and publishers. I'm not going to go into that now because that might be a rant. Uh, so the per finished hour model is the one that I use now. And in the UK, the average rate is something between 80 to 110 pounds per finished hour and it's usually somewhere in the middle. It's a lot lower than the rates narrators get in the States. In, in America, narrators get much higher per finished hour rates. And when I'm hired or when Audio Factory is, is hired by an American publisher, sometimes my rate will be different. It'll be higher because I've got enough experience to qualify for a certain rate in sag -Afra guidelines or something. I don't really understand. But anyway, yes, that's that's how much you get paid. So in terms of the amount of time, that's per finished hour. So you have hours of preparation time before where you're reading the book and acquiring the accents. You have travel time to and from the studio. You have the time that you're in the studio. You have the fact for me it may not be so relevant for people who only do audio book narration. But for me, I also have to take into account that I can't do any of my other work whilst I'm doing the audiobook. And then there will be a pickup session afterwards. Um, but I love it. And it's it's enough, it, it's enough. I don't know, I mean, you may have different ideas about what is a lot of money or not. For me, it feels like a nice big chunk of money because I'm an author. And so I have very, very sporadic income. I have royalties paid for me, paid to me twice a year and there are long gaps in between. So audio book narration goes really well hand in hand with being an author in terms of the of smoothing out the financial peaks and troughs. I hope the position of the camera hasn't changed too much. I had to go and check on my notes of what people wanted to know. So a few people have asked about um, how you deal with the different voices and keeping track of them. So 
that's where my notebook comes in um, in the first instance. If you're recording a series of books where there may be months, if not sometimes years between instalments, then um, we will literally, I say we, my lovely director will go and get samples of those particular characters from the book that we did before. I will look in my notes and usually from my notes I have a good idea of what kind of voice I was doing but sometimes I like to double check and there are kind of subtleties between um, different characters that will I'll remember when I hear them again. If I'm recording a book that's spread over a couple of weeks I don't need to do that. It's only if there's like months or years between different novels and the same characters running through them. How do I keep track of them when I'm recording? Once I'm well into a book they are just in my head, they're like characters in my head. It's like I think that's probably something that I've taken over from role playing or carried into this from role playing. Um, I kind of see them in my head, I feel their mannerisms, not physical mannerisms, their vocal mannerisms. Um, the way they're written, uh, you know, in particularly well written books, the actual way that they speak is tied to the way that they should sound. Um, sometimes it can be difficult reading dialogue um, where somebody is described as having a particular accent, but that accent isn't reproduced in the way that their dialogue is written. And so they will be saying words that generally aren't said in that particular accent. So if there's like a contraction which is common in an accent, or I may not know the sound of that particular phrase or word because it's just not said and that can be very difficult. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I keep track of them. They, the, the voice of the protagonist generally we have as my neutral voice. So if it's a female protagonist, it will be depending on the character. I mean, if the character is somebody who comes from up north, that it'll be that northern voice but we try generally if we have any um, control over what kind of accent or voice a character has we'll put it as close to my um, most comfortable neutral voice as possible just because it's just easier. As for determining how they sound I will take clues and the director takes clues from the text itself so even if we're not told what kind of person they are sometimes we will extrapolate it or infer it from how they're described what they do um, there's a character in the novel that I've just narrated, literally today, where she's awful, but it doesn't say that her voice sounds awful or anything like that. Occasionally she might get a bit shrill, but because of who she is and what she does in the book, we'll append a particular no set of notes to that character, which then gives rise to a particular voice. Sometimes it can be not just the region and the accent that they have, but it can also be things like socioeconomic status, because certainly in the UK, we are programmed to associate particular ways of speaking with particular socioeconomic groupings. And I do kind of hate that, but that's the way that it's a shorthand effectively. Um, so, you know, you won't have a character who is, you know, the bloke down the pub who is salt of the earth talking in a very, very plummy RP accent. And yes, it's a perpetuation of stereotypes, I suppose. But when you're narrating an audiobook, you don't want to do anything that will jar the, re the listener rather out of the story that would sound odd. Um, so you're always trying to make it sound as close to realism and everyday life and what people hear as possible. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how we keep track of the voices. Um, my notes on each character and the vision I have of them in my head is what guides me throughout the particular book. If there's a big gap, we just listen to the samples to double check. I think that's everything for in here. Um, I might do a follow up video. Uh, so if there are questions that I haven't answered, and I might find them when I look at my notes, um, put them in the comments below and I'll do a second video. I may do a second video anyway. Um, and I will just take a couple of shots through the window so you can see what I see when I'm sitting in the chair effectively. Um, but yeah, any questions that you've got, put them in the comments below. Um, if you found this useful, I have a Ko-fi and I have a Patreon and um, 
yeah I'm trying to earn a living through being a narrator and a writer so that's that really helps um so yeah um you can find that in the description below and I'll put it at the end of the video oh one other question someone asked how do I become a narrator actually I'm going to do that in a different video how do you become a narrator and what are the skills that you need um because people just assume that having a nice voice I don't think my voice is particularly nice but there we go having a nice voice and maybe being able to do accents are the most important um, skills for being an audiobook narrator no I don't think they are um, obviously if you've got a voice which sounds like gravel in a cement mixer you're going to be very limited in the type of things that you can narrate um, but yeah being able to sight read I think is very very important and um, and delivery and I'm going to do that in a different video. So. I've packed everything away now. Um, so if you imagine that we're sitting at the, the desk and I look over, there's a little window and that's where the director sits, but he's gone home. So yes, that's how, oh, I'm falling over the door. That's how that works. That's where I am. I'm, I'm walking backwards out of the booth now. And there's the door, which is also, you can see the foam on it. Um, and that closes. And then, this is like the little antechamber. And then that closes again to the outside one. Oh, this footage is probably gonna be terrible, but you know, Damn it, Jim, I'm an audiobook narrator, not a videographer. I don't even know if I've pronounced that right. I've recorded 30,000 words and a whole video, and that's it for my brain. Yay!